Good morning. Welcome to week three of our One Small Step series, and happy Father's Day to all of our fathers and father figures out there today. Uh, this series is a children's ministry sync series, so once a year we sync what we are doing here in our adult worship experience with what our children, birth through fifth grade, are learning. And so this series uh, is a series that they have uh, gone through based um, from our curriculum provider, Grow. In week one, we talked about the disciples taking their first small step and believing in Jesus. And last week, we talked about another small step that we need to take, praying for others. Today, I want to talk about a small step that most of us skip, telling others about Jesus. So let me ask you a question. How many stars are there in the galaxy? It's, it's not a rhetorical question. I'm really asking. How many stars are there in the galaxy? There's at least two. Yes, you are correct, Tom. What other answers we got? Trillions. Okay, well, the answer is even the smartest scientists are not sure. Okay? So you could all be right. We know that uh, stars die and new stars are born, but it happens light years away. So we're not really positive. There's no way for us to really know how many stars there are in the galaxy. And we cannot even see all of the stars that are in our galaxy, even with all of the latest modern cool space tech that we have. But most people agree there's somewhere between 100 and 400 billion stars in the galaxy, okay? So, you know, 100 to 400 billion, give or take a few. We might not be able to count the stars. We might not even be able to see all of the stars, but we can start with one star that we can all see, which is the sun. In Acts 1-8, which we read a few weeks ago, we see Jesus command his disciples to go to the ends of the earth to tell people about him. Jesus said this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Probably seems pretty huge, right? The ends of the earth. It's an impossible task. Sort of like counting the stars in the galaxy. But they obeyed. And they began to share the good news one person at a time. And we, call, we are called to do the same. There are over 8 billion people in the world. Okay, There's 2.4 billion that call themselves Christians. That means, I'm going to do a little math here, that means if each one of us took Jesus' instructions seriously, we could tell the entire world the truth of the gospel one person at a time over the next five years. The problem is, recent studies show that 60% of Christians do not share their faith because they do not know how. And 70% of Christians believe it's not even their responsibility to share their faith. And you might think, with all those people in the world, it might feel overwhelming to you, this command from Jesus to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to share the story of Jesus with so many people. I mean, where do we even begin sharing the gospel? Well, I'm going to help you with that today. I'm going to give you a method of sharing your faith with others that is easy to do and it's effective. It's only three steps. We call it pursuing the one at our church. It's one of our core values as a church because we understand the urgency to connect others in our lives who don't have a relationship with Jesus. And so we're going to commit to pray for and care for and share the story of God's work in our lives with those around us. And we know this calling is huge, but we're going to start by focusing on one at a time as we share the gospel with those that we love. See, step one is what we talked about last week, it starts by praying for others. So, you should have received a post-it note when you came in. If not, just wave your hand furiously and someone will bring you by a post-it note. 
Okay, you're going to need your post-it note and you're going to need something to write with. There's also a blank in your bulletin. On your post-it note, I want you to write down the name of someone in your life who does not have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, so I want you to write that on your post-it note and I want you to write it on the blank in your bulletin. Who is someone in your life who does not have a thriving relationship with with Jesus Christ. Now you might be asking, what does it mean to have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, let me tell you. A person who has a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ is defined by the six born-again behaviors that we talked about a few weeks ago. Born-again believers grow in community. Born-again believers live generously. Born-again believers serve others. Born-again believers spend time with God. Born-again believers share their faith. And born-again believers walk in obedience. A person who has a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ is born again. That means that they have surrendered to Jesus as Lord of their life and have been baptized by immersion in obedience to Him. And they exhibit these six behaviors. So I want you to write down the name of someone in your life who does not have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. And once you've done that, when we move into our response time here in a little bit, I want you to take this post-it note, and I want you to go post it on the vision wall next to the sign that says, Pursuing the One, so that we can pray for your one along with you. So think of someone in your life who does not have that thriving relationship. This is the first part of step one identifying someone that you need to pray for. The second part of that is committing to actually pray for that person. So in your bulletin, we've given you some space for you to write down a prayer for that person. We'd like you, like we talked about last week, to ask God to speak to you on behalf of that person that you're praying for. And if you know there's some specific things for you to pray about for them, then pray for those. But most importantly, we want you to pray that that person comes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and commits to make them Lord of their life. That's the first step of pursuing the one. Identifying someone who needs a relationship with Jesus Christ. It could be someone who maybe has heard of Jesus, maybe they've been to church their whole life, but they don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. They're not exhibiting these six born-again behaviors. And so we want you to write their name down. And we want you to begin praying for that person. We're going to stop what we're doing right now, actually, and we're going to spend some time praying. So in your bulletin, you found, you'll find a pre-written prayer where you can pray every single day for your friend who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, there's nothing special about this prayer it's just an example of something that you can pray. So once you have that name, I want you to write it in the blank of that prayer that's in your bulletin. And we're going to pray this together, okay? So I'm going to pray. You're going to pray with me. This is not a call and response time. Just pray out loud with me, okay? But you're going to insert your friend's name, all right? Everybody ready? Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that the darkness vanishes as I pray for the lost. Thank you for convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I pray that you will soften the heart of my friend, remove the spiritual blindness from their eyes, and help them to understand the truth about you. Use me to bring them to repentance and salvation. I believe that you're working in their hearts even as I pray. Help me to let my light shine before men that they may see my good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven. Help me to be your light in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so that's the first step. It's really that simple. If you have the name of someone in your life who does not have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you to pray this prayer every single day for that person. And again, there's nothing special about these words. You can change it up. You can 
you know, paraphrase if you want, but we want you to be praying every single day for that one person in your life. Now the next step for pursuing the one is to care for them. So there's some spots in your bulletin. What are some practical needs in your friend's life that you can help with? And how can you be used to meet those needs? So write down on the blank some ideas that you can help serve or care for your friend. And if you're not sure what to do, we've got nine things that you can do to care for someone located at the resource hub. So if you're unsure what to do, Here's the nine things, and there's a description about it. It's from a blog post. It says, pray for them, understand them, write to them, which maybe in modern lingo might be like text them. I don't know, man. I'd love to get an old-fashioned letter in the mail. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, call them, okay? Eat with them, listen to them, help them, invite them, and make a plan to care for them. Okay, so we want you to think about this person in your life you know doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. How can you care for them well? Because if you want your friend to have a thriving relationship with Jesus, then you're going to need to serve them like Jesus. That's because born-again believers serve others. Scripture commands us to earnestly desire the manifestation of spiritual gifts in our lives. And so we should commit to discover our God-given gifts so that we can build up God's church and serve the community. If you want your friend to have a thriving relationship with Jesus, you're going to have to pray for them, and you're going to have to care for them like Jesus. The third step in pursuing the one is sharing the story of what God has done in our lives. As an example, it might be sharing how God has healed you. Or maybe it's sharing how God has provided for you when you're in need. Or maybe it might be sharing how God was with you when you were going through a difficult time. Your personal testimony of God's move in your life is as such a powerful example of God's love for your friend. If God cares enough to move in your life, then God cares enough to move in your friend's life. And so on the blanks in your bulletin, we want you to answer those questions. What is a way that God has moved in your life? I think it's really cool over the last several weeks, we've seen God begin to move in our life, in our church, in the area of prophecy and dreams and spoken words, words of knowledge. We've seen God move in that way. And so maybe that's what God is doing in your life. Maybe God has given you a specific word of knowledge for your friend. Something that God wants you to share with them. And so we want you to write down, what is God doing in your life? How has God moved? How has God showed up? Write that down so that you can find a time to share it with your friend. That's that it. It's really that simple. Three steps. Pray for, care for, and share the story of what God has done in your life. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's simple. But I've found research shows that one reason people don't often share their faith is because of fear, which brings us to our passage of Scripture today. It's in Acts chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Acts 4. Acts is in the New Testament, so near the back of your Bible. It's after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 4, so you're looking for the big number 4. We're going to start in verse 1. In Acts 4, we see Peter and John confronted about the lame man that they healed in Acts chapter 3 that we talked about last week. So last week we talked about them praying for that lame man, and God supernaturally healed him. Well, we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 4. Here they are confronted about the miracle that God did through them. It says this, starting in verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
And so they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So as a result, Peter and John, who were sharing what God had done in their life, over 5,000 people were born again that day. That is the power of praying for, caring for, and sharing with those who do not have a thriving relationship with Jesus. See, that man that Peter and John encountered in Acts 3 was in need. He was lame since birth. And so Peter and John stopped what they were doing and they began praying for this man. Pray for. Then they cared for him by using the gifts that God had given them, and through the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, God used them to heal this man, care for. And after he was healed, he leaps for joy and goes with Peter and John into the temple to begin worshiping God, and Peter and John share what God has done in their lives And those men who were around them, they were born again as a result. As the result of hearing what God had done, how God had powerfully moved in this lame man's life, those around them, their lives were changed. And this did not make the Jewish leaders and scribes very happy. So they had Peter and John arrested and questioned. If we keep reading in Acts chapter 4 in verse 13, we find an important thing that we can learn from. It says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I want you to notice something here. It says Peter and John were uneducated. Common men. That means they didn't know everything there was to know about the Bible. They didn't have all the answers. They simply were men who loved Jesus and obeyed his command to tell the world about him. So not knowing enough about God or the Bible is no excuse for not sharing your faith. So if you say, well, you know, I I don't really know much about the Bible. I can't really tell people about Jesus. It's not an excuse. Peter and John were uneducated men common men, but they were common men who believed what Jesus said, they obeyed his command, and they took this small step and began sharing what he had done in their lives. If we continue reading, it says this, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, what shall be done with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may not spread further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more of anyone on this matter, so that they called them in and charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. The world... Our culture has always been and will always be hostile to the gospel. See, the Jewish leaders wanted to stop the truth from going any further among the people. Our culture is the same today. They do not want people to hear the truth that the God who created them actually loves them enough to save them from their sin. And that is because the ruler of the world, Satan, who is the enemy of God and his people and the truth, doesn't want the truth to get out. Look how Peter and John respond. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must be the judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Let me just stop right there. Is your relationship with Jesus Christ at such a depth that you cannot but speak about what God has done in your life? That you're willing to go toe-to-toe with the authorities if they ask you to stop? 
that you cannot help but share what God has done in your life? Is your faith at that level? Because that's where Peter and John are. They were told, hey, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they said, we can't help it. We can't help but share what God has done in our life because it is so powerful. It is so moving. God has changed us so much. We cannot help but speak it. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to actually punish them because of the people. For all of the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So this lame man was lame since birth for 40 years. He lay at the temple gate begging for money, begging for a way to survive. And then God shows up through Peter and John who took the time to stop and pray. And then they cared for this man by using the gifts God had given them to not provide him with resources but to actually change his life forever. This man was miraculously healed. And then they go and tell everyone, thousands of people commit their life to Christ, and they're arrested and tried because of the gospel. Is your faith that powerful? Is your faith that strong? Peter and John could not help but tell other people about Jesus and what He had done in their lives. And that's because born-again believers share their faith. Jesus commands us to go into all the world to make disciples. And so we should be committed to pray for, care for, and share our story of God's work in our life with those around us who do not have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. We must also be committed to discipling other believers so that they can grow in their faith. And since it's Father's Day, I can't help but address the parents, specifically the fathers. In Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, you're given this specific instruction. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Men, that means it's time for you to step it up. Jesus Christ commanded you to help your children be raised in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That means if your children do not have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ, it's your fault and your responsibility. See, we are commanded to go into all the world and make disciples. The problem is, Our American church culture is that fathers wouldn't even be bothered enough to disciple those kids in their own home. Notice what this verse does not say. This verse in Ephesians 6, 4 does not say, Fathers, provide for your family so that your wife can raise your children in the Lord. It does not say, Fathers, make sure that your kids go to church so the church can raise your children in the Lord. It's not what this verse says. It does say, fathers, bring your children up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. Now, wives, I love you. You're doing an incredible job raising your kids. But it's time for the men to actually step up and begin to spiritually invest in the next generation so that they can love Jesus Christ. And it starts in the home. Don't just tell your kids to read their Bible. Open up your Bible and begin reading it with them. Don't just tell your kids to pray. Actually spend time praying with them. Be the leaders and the example that you are biblically called to be. And don't just let your kids serve. Show up and serve with them. See, it's an absolute crime that our family ministry spaces have virtually no men who want this next generation to grow up knowing and loving Jesus Christ. 
Four out of our 17 volunteers in family ministry are men. Which I can't even believe that we only have 17 people in this church who actually care about the next generation that they will hear the gospel. It's sad that we only have four men who are willing to invest in the lives of young people in this church. And you might say, I'm not good with kids. Well, tough cookies. You are called to raise this next generation in the instruction of the Lord. Which means, men, it's our opportunity, it's our command, it's our expectation, it is our responsibility if this next generation doesn't know Jesus Christ. It's on us. And it's time we step up. There are thousands of things you could do every single week to invest in the next generation. You could provide meals on Thursday for the students who come over and learn about what it means to be born-again believers. You can hang out in a classroom. Trust me, the lessons are not that difficult. You might learn something. And I know it might sound harsh, but the reality is this next generation, if you talk to these kids, they are dying for the gospel. They are desperate to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And when they hear that truth, they are more on fire than any generation I've ever seen. I mean, you got preschoolers out praying for people. That's not normal. That's God moving in their life. And it is a crime that this next generation doesn't have biblically founded, solid men of God who will take the time to invest in their lives. I'm tired of kids and students growing up with absent fathers who say they love Jesus. Something has to change. If you are a born-again believer, then you are commanded to go into all the nations and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and make disciples of every nation. And it starts in our homes. It starts in our churches. It starts in our community. It starts with one. And so as we move into our time of response, I want to ask you a really simple question. Are you willing to be obedient to Christ and pursue the one? If you are, then I want to close with this. It's found at the end of Acts chapter 4. After Peter and John are released... Starting in verse 23, it says this, When Peter and John were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, whom the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage? And the people plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servants, Jesus, whom whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now... Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And while you stretch out your hand to heal, signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. And when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. In the face of arrest, threats, and persecution, Peter and John stood up and said, we cannot help but speak what the Lord has done in our lives. In our culture, in the face of being made fun of, in the face of actually having to do something, In the face of complacency and apathy, let's stand up 
and boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that is dying and going to hell. It's time we stand up. Because we often skip this step of telling others about Jesus. It's far easier to skip this step. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It requires time, effort, intentionality. And let's just be honest, we're not willing to give those most of the time. But we are commanded to go into all the world. So let's start with one. Let's start with one person who needs to know that Jesus Christ loved them enough to die for them in their place for their sin. Let's start with our children. Let it not be said of us that we raise a generation of kids who walk away from the church. Let it not be said of us that we raise a generation of kids who are apathetic to the gospel. Let it not be said of us that we let this generation slip through our fingers without doing everything it takes to make sure they know who Jesus Christ is. Let us be a church. Let us be fathers. Let us be men who step up and raise this generation to charge hell with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we pray for boldness. Forgive us for our apathy. Forgive us for our complacency, our laziness, God. We pray for boldness. That in the face of any opposition, whether it be time, whether it be culture, whether it be our friends, whatever it is that stands in the way of us boldly proclaiming the gospel, we ask that you remove it right now. Let us be men and women who stand up and share the truth in a world that doesn't want to hear it. Let us boldly proclaim the word of truth. And God, we pray that you pour out your spirit upon us. That signs and wonders follow what you are doing. That miracles begin to happen as a testimony of your love for this culture that hates you. God, we pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus. The testimonies of healing will rise up in this place. The people will know that our God is a God who loves us, who still moves today, who heals us, who speaks to us, who shows up. Our God is alive. And give us the courage and the boldness to actually go and proclaim that. And God, we pray for every single one of these ones. The names that we've written down, people who do not have a thriving relationship with you. God, we pray for for courage and the reminder to pray for them every single day. God, we pray for opportunities to care for them well that you will give us ways that we can show the love of Christ to those who don't know you. And God, we pray for an opportunity to speak clearly and boldly the truth of what you've done in our lives. God, may we not be a church that you look upon and see that we've wasted our time not being about your business, God. God, we pray that you move in and through us so that the world may know that you love them. In Jesus' name, amen.